Right. Hey everyone, it's Pranav, and in this lecture, we're going to be covering contour integration, or integration in the complex plane. So obviously, a background of calculus will be required to understand what's going on, and we're going to be using analysis techniques as well to prove some of the theorems that we derive. So you don't really need to be familiar with the analysis part because you can obviously use the result without really knowing how the proof works, but you are going to really need to know at least basic differentiation and integration to understand what's going on. I am going to review all of that in the context of the complex plane where some things are a little bit different at the very beginning in case you do need that review. So there are going to be a lot of parallels to vector calculus because we can think of the complex plane, which we denote by C, as just like R squared in the sense that like we have one real number and another real number to form a complex number. However, the concept of a differentiable function is a lot different in the complex plane because it's a much more strict and stronger result than in the real line, which is another way to say R because it's a one-dimensional set, so it's just a line. So a lot of results in complex analysis are actually rather clean, and that's completely contrary to real analysis because the concept of differentiable functions are much stronger in the complex plane. So. Before we can talk about integration, we need to define the actual functions that we're going to be integrating. So these are very similar to their real counterparts. But so if we have a function from the complex plane to the complex plane, say f from c to c, we can split it into a real and imaginary part. So we can express f as the sum of two functions, say u and v, and these are both multivariable functions because they take two variables, say x and y. So if we define a number z in the complex plane as x plus iy, I know you might be used to seeing a plus bi instead, but in complex analysis, we usually use x plus iy instead. And we do put the i first. So we can split this function into two functions, right, u and v. So we have f of x plus iy equals u of xy plus iv of xy. And this is the real part of f, and this is the imaginary part of f, okay? So just like real functions, we have a domain, image, codomain, all of that stuff. So similarly to functions, we can analogously define the limit and derivative in, of a function in the complex plane. And just like for real, functions, limits are unique if they exist in the complex plane. And there are some more things that are going on with that specific statement that we'll touch back on shortly. But all properties of limits are preserved in the complex plane, such as like linearity. So like if you have the limit of f plus the limit of g, if they're both going to the same point, then you can add them. Or if you want to like do the limit of f times the limit of g, is this equal to the limit of f times g? And division, all that stuff is maintained. It's the same. So like that, we can define what a continuous function is. So a continuous function in the complex plane, so we'll reuse our definition of f over here. And in general, unless I explicitly write it, then we can assume that z is equal to x plus i y and that f is a function from c to c, okay? So a function f is continuous at a point c0, so we can say f is continuous um, at a point z0 equals x0 plus i y0 if this is almost exactly the same. We have the limit as z approaches z0 of f of z equals f of z0. 
So this is the continuity. And furthermore, we can extend this actually to um, the component functions u and v. So we can always assume that f can be split into u plus iv. So both u and v are going to be continuous at the point x0, y0, which should make sense. So similarly, we have the derivative, which is almost the same as it is in the for real functions. So we have f prime of z sub zero is just the limit as z approaches zero of f of z minus f of z zero over z minus z zero. So this limit, this this is the quotient definition of the derivative, which may be a little bit different from the one that you're used to seeing, but they mean the same thing. So just like for real functions, so in, for in R, the, the derivative is a linear operator, which means we have linearity of the derivative, as which is preserved in the complex plane. And all the other properties of the derivative, like addition, which is covered by linearity, but multiplication, division, and composition are all, and the like, chain rule, all of that stuff is preserved in the complex plane. But I'm going to mention again that the derivative is a much stronger result in C than it is in R, and we'll touch on that shortly. So, um, one important result, however, in complex analysis. So, up until now, we've covered you know familiar things. We're going to cover something different now or new. So that is the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Or equation. So. These are a set of necessary conditions for differentiability, but they are not sufficient. What that means is that if a function is differentiable at a point, say like z, then these, this equation is going to be satisfied. But however, just because f satisfies this equation does not mean that we can conclude f is differentiable. So, we have our same definition for f, same definition z equals x plus i y, and we're going to assume that the derivative exists. So assume, assume f prime of z exists at z equals x plus i y. Then the force, the first order partial derivatives of u and v exist. So then the first order partial derivatives of u and v exist. And remember, these are the component functions of f. And we have the following equation, which will always be satisfied. We have du over dx equals dv over dy. So the partial derivative of u with respect to x is equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y. And we have that d u dy equals minus dv dx. In other words, the partial derivative of u with respect to y is equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to x. In shorthand notation, this is u sub x equals v sub y and u sub y equals minus v sub x. Okay? And furthermore, we have one more thing. We can actually express the derivative in terms of these partial derivatives of the, com of the component functions. Namely, we have the f prime of z equals dx, no, sorry, not x, du dx, du dx of xy plus dv dx of xy. And we are guaranteed that these exist if f prime is differentiable, like we've stated in this theorem. So I did want I did say before these are not sufficient, and this is because if we go back to that slide. Uh okay, well I, I don't know how to go back this is a new app I'm using but if you 
you can like go back in the video probably. But if you notice that we never said that f has to be a continuous function, that's one of the missing conditions. We are missing some continuity conditions, which makes the this not sufficient to conclude a function is differentiable. But it's actually very useful if we need to like introduce this property that the partial derivatives are equal into solving a problem, or if we just want to check that a function is differentiable. If it fails to satisfy, then we automatically know it's not differentiable at that point. So now we're going to define a very important type of function, which is a holomorphic function. So holomorphic function. These are extremely important in complex analysis. So we're using the same definition of f. So I say a function f is holomorphic if it is differentiable at every point of an open set S, which is a subset of the complex plane. At every point in an open set okay so this is a little bit different than just hey this function is differentiable everywhere in the set of R because this is actually much stronger in C so before I mentioned that we're going to touch back on the uniqueness of limits so Similarly, if you've done vector calculus, you'll know this very well. But similarly to limits, in higher dimensions of R, say like R squared, R cubed, R to Rn, right? A limit at a point Z0 in C has to be the same across all paths one can take to arrive at the point. Otherwise, it does not exist. And this is actually a common way to check if a limit exists. We can pick two random paths and check if they're equal. If they're not equal, then we know the limit does not exist. So this property of limits in the complex plane makes the function makes the derivative, which is defined as a limit, inherently stronger, because this is not true for the normal real line. And this allows holomorphic functions to satisfy the property of analyticity. And this is why you'll sometimes see holomorphic functions. Actually, it's very common to have them referred to as analytic functions. They're used interchangeably. But do remember that holomorphic is the type of functions and sorry, and analytics analyt, analytic describes the property that they are satisfying. So um, analyticity means that at every point on this domain, or where it is holomorphic, f is given. So like if f is an analytic function, it's given by a convergent power series. So what this means is that by consequence, every holomorphic function or differentiable function at a point because we can say that you know f is holomorphic at just this point it means that all these differentiable functions in the complex plane are infinitely differentiable because they are given by a convergent power series and lastly if a function is analytic on the entire complex plane it's called an entire function analytic or holomorphic, same thing, on C, okay? And if you, sometimes you might see the term meromorphic, which 
which is just analytic except at some isolated points. So an obvious example of this would be like f of z equals 1 over z. It's analytic everywhere except at 0 because it's not defined there. So with, and I do want to mention one thing, with all these mentions of like derivative properties are so similar or limit properties are so similar and preserved in the complex plane, I do want to mention one thing that is not preserved is the mean value theorem. This is not true in C. Just wanted to mention that. So now that we've covered all of this like preview content or like requisite content, we can talk about complex integration. But first, we need to talk about integration of complex valued functions of real variables. So what this means is we have a function w from r to c. And we have w of t equals u of t plus iv of t. And obviously, t is in r. So this could be something like, I don't know, W of T equals 2TI or something. So these are actually very easy to integrate because like we were splitting these functions into component functions before, we can split them into the integrals. These integrals can be split into the integrals of the component functions. So we can do, if we were to do this, right? We want to do the integral from a to b of w of t dt is just the integral from a to b of say u, d, u of t dt plus i times the integral from a to b of v of t dt. Obviously provided that these integrals exist. So all the properties of integration hold here, the fundamental theorem of calculus, like linearity of the integral, all of that. The only difference from normal real functions is that we split the integral into real and imaginary parts. So with that out of the way, we can talk about the main subject of this lecture, which is the contour integral. So if you have done vector calculus, this will look extremely familiar to you because contour integrals are just line integrals in the complex plane. They're actually a special case of line integrals. So their definition is exactly the same, except we take them over a contour, which is a special kind of arc in the complex plane, which I'm going to define shortly. So why would we integrate over these like contours or arcs or curves instead of a normal integral? Well, we have to know, we have to think about the fact that the complex plane is not an ordered set. We can't say that if we have two numbers like w and z in the complex plane, we can't write that w is less than z. This is not valid. We can compare the magnitudes, but we can't compare the numbers themselves. So this makes integration inherently more complicated because we can't like integrate over an interval. We have to integrate over a curve, which is also known as a contour. Well, not exactly. A contour is a specific type of curve or arc, which we'll define shortly. So what's an arc? An arc, it's a set of points, say Z, right? Such that we have X is X of T, Y is Y of T, right? And for say T is in this interval, to be. Also, all these intervals are closed. I kind of suck at writing brackets, so if they do look like they're open intervals, they're all closed, just to mention, unless I specifically say it's an open interval, which I don't think will occur or happen. So we can say z equals z of t, right? And we can write that z equals x of t plus i y of t. So in short, an arc is just a set which we can parameterize by this function and it draws a curve like this or something. Like this can be our arc. 
And so there are a few kinds of arcs. We can we say that an arc is simple or a Jordan if it does not self intersect. So if it never touch if it never intersects itself, so not self intersecting. If an arc is simple everywhere except at its endpoints. So if z of a equals z of b, if t is defined on the interval, again, this is closed, a of a and b, right? If this is true, then we call it a simple closed curve. Curve. These are arcs, and this is also called a Jordan curve. So a simple, simple closed curve and Jordan curve are the same thing. So, and now I will mention one thing. If the curve is traversed counterclockwise, it is considered positive. However, if we traverse the curve clockwise, this is negative. It's just like physics, counterclockwise considered positive. So let's look at an example. So let's consider the unit circle. It should be rather easy to come up with the function for. It's just e to the i theta. So we can parameterize the unit circle by z equals e to the i theta for theta on the interval 0 to pi. And if we want to generalize this to a circle of radius r centered at z sub 0, we can write, we have z of theta equals r e to the i theta plus z sub 0. For theta is defined on the same integral. So there are a couple things here. Z of negative theta, while the points are exactly the same, it does not dr draw the same curve. Because remember I mentioned that counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. The direction of where you travel across each theta or input is actually different. It's opposite. So these are not considered to be the same curve, even though the set of points is the same. So similarly, if we look at like a z of k theta, right? So if we increase the exponent by a factor of k, we traverse the circle k times as theta varies from zero to two pi. So it's not really the same thing, even though the point, the set of points is the same, which is the main point I'm trying to illustrate. A curve is not unique on its set of points. So obviously, an arc itself can be differentiable if we can differentiate the parameterizing function. So say x, y, x and y are differentiable, which makes z differentiable on the interval t from a to b. Then we can call the arc c a differentiable arc. differentiable arc. Okay, so then we can actually actually integrate the real function z of z prime of t, the magnitude of z prime of t, and this should look very familiar. And if we integrate this, from A to B, right? If we integrate this, this is just the arc length. And yeah, this is considered to be the length of the arc and we denote it by L usually. And speaking of the magnitude of the derivative of the curve or the arc, we can also talk about the unit tangent vector 
which you should remember if you've done vector calculus, it's exactly the same here. And the angle of inclination of this vector relative to the real axis of the complex plane, say we have here, so this angle here, is just the argument, oh, not capital arg, it's lowercase, because those are actually different. Okay. That's the angle of inclination. So if z prime is continuous, then we call the curve it parameterizes a smooth curve. Which should make sense because as long if it's continuous, there are no gaps or like sharp turns or anything. So now we can talk about what a contour is. Which is it's a special kind of arc. So contour. A contour is a piecewise smooth arc or an arc consisting of a finite number of smooth arcs joined end to end. When z of a equals z of b, if the entire contour is defined on the interval from t, the uh, closed interval of t from a, uh, from a to b, right? We can we say that the contour is a simple closed contour. These are piecewise smooth arcs. And then if z of a equals z of d, it is a simple closed contour. So I'm not going to prove this next statement because it's a perfect example of a theorem that seems extremely simple but has a rather complicated in terms of elementary theory proof. You need some rather advanced topology that I don't really understand either. So I'm not going to prove it because why would I prove something that I don't understand? So the, this is the Jordan curve theorem. Okay, so this states that every Jordan curve divides the plane into two regions. That may seem simple, but so we have that it divides the plane into an interior region, which is bounded by the curve, and an exterior region. This means that, and we have every path connecting the exterior to the interior must intersect the curve at some point. Again, this sounds really simple, but we can think of it as like, if we have the plane right on our paper and we have some curve C. If we have a path, right? And this is the interior, exterior, it's going to intersect the curve obviously at some point. And this proof is actually really complicated in terms of topology, well, to me anyway. So I'm not going to prove it. And it's a rather interesting or obvious result. So now how do we write a contour integral? Again, it's going to look really familiar to those of you who have done vector calculus. We denote the contour integral of f over a contour c by that. And if we are integrating over a simple closed contour, then we use a slightly different notation. We have a circle on the integral to denote that the path we're taking is closed. So this is contour 
and this is simple coilless conduit. Okay, so there isn't really a like physical or geometric interpretation of a contour integral. Unlike with like, you know, a normal integral, you can just say, hey, I have the area under a curve. You can't really do that. And also, we do need to make a couple assumptions before we can actually explicitly state the formal definition of the contour integral. That is namely, f of z of t should be piecewise continuous on the interval that we are integrating over. If c is parameterized by a curve of z of t. So once we have that, we can state that the contour integral of a function f along a contour c, which is parameterized by z of t, And t is on the interval a b is this. And this is the exact definition of a line integral. So that's why I was stressing the fact that these are just a special case of line integrals because they're actually pretty much the same thing. Okay, so if a contour can be expressed as a sum of like say n contours, so if we have c1, c2, c3, cn, and they're all connected at n their endpoints, say we have like c1, then c2, c3, c4, c5 c6, and this is c, then the contour integral of f over c itself is just equal to this. It's rather obvious. Uh, whoops. We can just sum the integral over the individual contours. So next is going to be a rather famous example. So evaluate. We're trying to evaluate this, where c is the unit circle. So. If we can recall from the previous example, the unit circle is just parameterized by this, e to the i theta, for theta in 0 to 2 pi. So if we write out the definition of our contour integral for the integral of 1 over z dz, we have 0 to 2 pi of 1 over e to the i theta times i e to the i theta d theta. So we can obviously cancel these, and we have the integral of i from 0 to 2 pi d theta. And this is just 2 pi i. Rather simple. Uh, also, this should be a closed contour, sorry. Yeah, okay. So this next example, I have blatantly stolen from my complex analysis exam a few days ago. So that is, we are going to be evaluating the contour integral of f of z equals z squared on the contour C equals C1 plus C2, where C1 is the upper half of the unit circle, and C2 is the line from negative 1 to 1. 
So obviously we should split this up into two integrals because we can just sum the integrals over the individual contours instead of trying to find some weird function that is going to parameterize a semicircle. That's not even a function. So for C1, it should look very familiar. It's just z equals e to the i theta on 0 to pi this time because it's only the upper half. So if we write out the integral for C1, it's e to the 2i theta times i e to the i theta d theta from 0 to pi. And after some algebra, we have i of minus 1 over 3i minus 1 over 3i is just negative 2 thirds. For c2, we can just use z of t equals t. And t is on the interval negative 1, 1. So if you write out the integral for this, two-thirds. So we had two-thirds from C2 and negative two-thirds from C1. Summing these up, so if we sum C1 plus C2, we get a zero, and that's the answer. This is not just a coincidence, however, and we'll return to this later. Next, let's look at something called, this is a very famous inequality in real analysis as well. So this is a lemma. But I guess you could call it a theorem. It's pretty important. So let's say w of t is a piecewise continuous function and it's complex value. And say we define this on the interval t from a to b. That is the worst comma I have ever seen in my life. OK, so then we can actually bound the modulus of this integral. Namely, we can write, oh, it's not f, it's w. Oops. There. This is a pretty famous inequality, and it's actually pretty important. And it should be familiar. So now we can actually state the maximum modulus principle. We can bound the line integral of a function. if the function itself is bounded, or if the modulus of the function is bounded, sorry. So if we assume our standard assumption, so if C is a contour, and this time we're going to have C has length L, and uh, again, F of Z is gonna be piecewise continuous. If m is a non-negative constant such that the modulus of f is less than or equal to m for all z on the contour of which f of z is defined. So in other words, f of z is going to be bounded. So the modulus of f by m on c, so we can write. then we can bound the line integral of f of z on c like follows. OK, this is a short proof, so I'll do it. 
So we're going to let z equal z of t, okay, such that z of t parameterizes c. So we have z, which parameterizes c, okay? So from the above lemma, we can, the one that we just talked about, um, Oops. And if we're going to write out the entirety of the line integral, right? I did skip a step where I changed this to its actual representation and then rebound it. So we can obviously write Right, because f is actually bounded by z prime. And actually, these are equal. But whatever, it has the same result. So if we rewrite the integral above, we can just write m outside. And we can bound this on that. Oh yeah, I do need that. But this should look familiar. This is just the arc length. So it's L. So we have successfully proved that we can bound this by amount. So it's a short, easy proof. So now it's gonna get a little nasty because we're going to talk about everyone's favorite theorem from vector calculus. Green's theorem, and we're going to use it to prove a rather important result. So if you recall from before that the, that integral of z squared was zero, and I said that wasn't coincidental, we can actually characterize these types of, types of results by something called the Cauchy-Gorsat theorem. So to prove this, I'm going to need to introduce Green's theorem, and everyone hates Green's theorem, so let's just get it over with. That's not what I meant to do. Here, Green's theorem. Okay. So you're gonna have. So this is the normal, or the for. This is the general line integral definition. So. Instead of saying contour, we're going to say suppose C is a positively oriented, piecewise, smooth, simple, closed curve. It's a lot of words in a plane. Right, so this is C is a piecewise, simple, smooth, closed curve in a plane. And let D be a region bounded by C. If P and Q be functions of X, Y defined on an open region containing D. And we're going to say that the partial derivatives of P and Q are continuous on that region. then we can actually say that the line integral of C of P dx plus Q dy is equal to the surface integral over the region D of the partial derivative of P with respect to X minus the partial derivative of Q with respect to Y of dx dy. So this is pretty nasty, which is why no one likes it. 
but we can now use this to show something interesting. So let's say we actually have our standard definition of the complex value function f. So that would be it's equal to u of xy plus iv of xy. But with the Green's theorem, this is just the sum of two functions. And the contour integral is a line integral. So we can express this in terms of this, a surface integral over a region, say, r, that's bounded by the contour c. So you can write this out. And we're going to use the partial derivative shorthand notation because I'm lazy. And we're going to split it up into two integrals. Minus v of y dA. Right. And now we're going to make one more assumption that f is a holomorphic function. So if you remember, we covered the cauchy riemann equation before. And then from those, we have that ux equals vy and u of y equals minus vx. And what do we have right here and right here? We're subtracting something from itself. So that's zero. And that means we have f of z and dz equal to zero. So from this, we've assumed that f prime is continuous. And f is analytic or holomorphic. However, we can omit the f prime is continuous condition, which is what Gorsat himself proved. The rest of this stuff was done by Cauchy before him. So we can state the formal Cauchy Gorsat theorem. If f is analytic on a con at all points I should have the closed thing here. Symbol closed contour C and all points inside it. then the line integral of f over this simple closed contour is zero. I'm not gonna prove this because it requires a ton, or not a ton, but it's a rather more analysis flavored proof. And I don't think it's in the scope of the handout, so I'm just gonna admit it. So next, we're going to move on to another very fundamental result, which is the Cauchy integral formula. And the extended Cauchy integral formula. So if we suppose f is analytic, both inside and on a simple closed contour c, in the positive sense, okay? And if we have z0 as any interior point of the contour, okay, so we have f analytic. And z0 is some point within c, but not on it. Then we have f of z0 is actually equal to 1 over 2 pi i of the contour integral of f of z dc over z minus z0. So this is also a rather analysis flavored proof, I guess. Well, I can run through it. So let's let C of rho 
denote the positively oriented circle such that the C minus C zero is less than, or not less than, sorry, equal to rho, okay? And we're gonna suppose that C of rho is interior to C. And we're going to note that f of z over z minus z zero is analytic in between zero and c. Now, using a different result called the principle of deformation of paths, the contour integral of this quotient on both c and c rho have to be equal. So we can actually write this. Uh, this is a long statement. And we can actually evaluate this integral over here. It's just 2 pi i. Okay. So, f is also a continuous function because it's analytic. So, this means we have f of z minus f of z zero is going to be less than epsilon whenever z minus c zero is less than delta. This is just the definition of continuity. Now, suppose we let rho be less than delta. Then we can write I mean, less than right. <coughs> Excuse me. Equals two pi epsilon, and we know that the modulus is never negative of this integral. From that, we can conclude that it's actually just going to be equal to zero. Because epsilon was an arbitrarily small number. So from this, and we know the integral from before, we can write that f of z dz over c minus c zero is going to be equal to two pi i f of zero. C zero, sorry. And we're done. So we can extend the Cauchy integral formula to provide a representation of higher order derivatives. So we assume the same things as before, except this time, our end result, and this means the nth derivative of f, is going to be n factorial over 2 pi i um, times the integral of c f of z dz over z minus z0 to the n plus 1. And this is the extended. Cauchy integral formula. So I'm going to go through a quick and easy integral that we can evaluate using this. So let's say we have this integral. And C is the positively oriented unit circle.
So let's let f equal e to the 2z, okay? So we can rewrite this as right and from the extended Cauchy integral formula above we can just write that this is equal to 2 pi i over 3 factorial because remember it's n plus 1 here times f3 of 0 OK, and this is just if we can bash out the derivative of e to the 2z, right? We're going to get 8e to the 2z. Then we plug in our stuff. Oh, sorry, 4, 4, not, not 8. OK. Um, wait, no, it is 8. Sorry, but whatever, we'll get 8 pi i over 3 because the 2 will cancel from the 8 in the top. And then there's a 2 that's there again. Yeah, I got confused there for a minute, sorry. But, okay, so there are a couple more things we can conclude from this. So. One consequence of this extension is that if f is an analytic function at a point c, its derivatives of all orders are also analytic at that point. So this is actually an explanation for why all differentiable functions in c are infinitely differentiable. They have to be analytic. And this also follows from that power series argument. So there's like two ways to say the same thing, which is always good. So this extends the partial derivatives of u and v if we have our standard definition of f. Okay, we can also check the analytic, analy check if f is analytic by, if it satisfies this property. So you have another lemma. Say f is continuous on a domain d, then the contour integral, if the contour integral is zero for every symbol, closed contour, C and D, then F must be analytic. on D. And this is actually pretty easy to prove. It just follows from the fact that F has to have an antiderivative on D. And then the previous result finishes. That you can chain the, analytic, the property that the function is analytic and its derivative. So now we're going to do something that it's actually pretty cool. So you may remember, say you're sitting in like algebra two or something, and you're learning this thing called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And if you ask your teacher, like, how do we know that's true? How do we prove it? They may have told you to just assume it's true because you can't prove it. Well, now we're gonna prove it. So first we need to talk about one powerful result. And we're going to prove it too. So first we're going to just talk about Liouville's theorem. So say f is an entire function. So suppose F is entire. And is bounded. In the complex plane. Then. 
f has to be a constant. And how do we prove this? Well, first, we're going to have to introduce what is known as Cauchy's inequality. And this is not the same thing as cauchy schwarz This is something else. Okay, so if we suppose f is analytic inside and on a positively oriented circle c sub r centered at c0 with radius r. Okay, so f analytic on slash in c sub r, which is radius r, centers c0. Okay, so let's let m sub r denote the maximum value of the modulus of f on cr. Okay, then we can write this. And this holds for all n in the natural numbers. So this is just easy to prove by the extended Cauchy integral formula. And then we can bound the modulus of the contour integral that follows. So back to our proof of Lyoville's theorem. Sorry if I'm buttering the pronunciation. I haven't actually heard the words spoken out loud before. I've only read them. So if we know that f is entire, as we were given in the theorem statement, we can choose any z0 and r for the above lemma because, you know, we can pick any circle if it's analytic on the entire complex plane, right? So let's take n equals 1. We can bound the modulus of the derivative of f at z0, and this is just m over r. Or, well, m sub 1, I guess. I'll just call it m. And obviously, since we can pick any circle, r can be arbitrarily large. And m does not depend on r, right? And since r is going to be arbitrarily large, this means that this can only hold when this quotient is just 0. Obviously, this means if f prime of z is 0, because we said z0 is arbitrary, which means it this property holds for every z0. So we can say that the modulus of the derivative of f itself is 0. And this holds for all z in the complex plane. Naturally, if the modulus of the derivative is 0, this means f is a constant function. f is constant. And we're done. Not a difficult proof if you can just use Cauchy's inequality, and it's a very powerful statement. So now we can prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, so any polynomial. This is very familiar to all of us. P of z equals the sum um, k equals 0 to n of a of k, z of k, right? Such that a of n does not equal 0 of degree n is greater than or equal to 1 has at least 
one root. That is there exists some z0 in the complex plane such that p of z sub 0 is 0. All right, now time for the proof. So we are going to proceed by contradiction here. So assume for the sake of contradiction, that p of z is not zero for any z in the complex plane. So if this is true, then obviously one over p of z is gonna be entire. Cause uh, p is a polynomial. So there is a way we can bound the modulus of one over p of z for any polynomial and that is we have the 1 over p of c it's going to be less than 2 over modulus of a of n times r of n for the modulus of z is greater than r r not for whenever okay so what this tells us is that 1 over p of z bounded on the disk, no, oh, sorry, bounded on the region exterior to the disk. Um, magnitude of z is less than or equal to r. Okay, and p of z is continuous on this disk. So this should look very familiar. If P of Z is bounded in the entire plane, oh, sorry. If it's bounded there too, it has to be bounded in the entire plane. Okay? So if one over P of Z is bounded in the entire plane and is an entire function by, the, by Liouville's theorem that we just proved, it has to be constant. If 1 over p of z is constant, that means p of z is also constant. But Remember above that we said that the degree of p of z has to be greater than or equal to 1, which means it cannot be a constant. Contradiction. So there has to be some z in the complex plane such that p of z is 0. And we are done. And that is the proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So we can also use this argument to show that P of Z cannot have more than N distinct roots. So the theorem above, so we're guaranteed that P has one root, say Z1, okay? So we're guaranteed that say P of Z1 equals zero for some P. Uh, some z1 in this complex plane, okay? So, since we're guaranteed one root, we can write p of z as z minus z sub 1 times, uh, not p, let's pick a different letter, q1 of z, okay? And obviously we know that this is going to be a polynomial. Right? But we can apply the same argument we just made to Q1 of Z. And we can write, say, Q1 of Z is going to be 
z minus some z2 times q2 of z, okay? And we can chain this down until we get that, say, like qn of z is just equal to some k, a constant. k and z, okay? So then we can write p of z as a product of n linear factors up to a constant. So then we can write p of z as like k of So this guarantees that p of z can't have more than n distinct roots. Obviously, some of the zj can be equal. That's when we have algebraic multiplicity of roots. But we've proved that we can't have more than n distinct roots. And with that, that's everything I have for today. Um, this is obviously not comprehensive on contour integrals. In particular, there are a couple inequalities that I skipped and some more things like that. And you can actually show that all these properties are invariant over a representation of the contour, which is like if you take a function, say phi or phi, and you have phi defined of, which maps to c, which is c of t, right? And you can change the interval. You can show that all these properties are actually the same. Like the answer would be the same. So I skipped that. Um, as for sources, I would recommend if you want to learn more that you read complex variables and applications by Rule Churchill and James Ward. That's the textbook I used for my complex analysis class. And I also did dip into a couple of notes from my complex analysis class. The lecture notes are pretty good. But yeah, that's all I have for today. I hope you had fun because this content is really, really cool. And you can always, you know, DM me or contact me if you have any questions and I'll try my best to answer. See you later.